So the case for biochar, and uh, I don't know if I got the right exact title, but uh, concerning it to you, you draw down the initiative as many other organizations have. Um, so um, I've known bio, bio, I've known about biochar from Ron Larson some 13 years ago, aka Cara Preta was discovered in the Amazonians. So I'm going to talk about what I've learned in my last 12, 13 years of exposure. Um, starting in Denver, I moved to Whidbey Island two years ago, um, and um, but I learned it through Ron Larson. Some any of you that've been long-term biochar enthusiasts know that Ron Larson. He's 87, lives lived a few houses away from me in Golden, Colorado, before I moved, and um, we'll get to that. I have this in case I needed it. So I have a bachelor's in geology uh, from the University of Washington, went on for my master's and PhD at Brown. I'm a micro paleo, paleo climate guy. I've studied ice ages as a stabilized topgeochemist geochemist and micro paleontologist and uh, worked in oil and gas various times. I went back paleo oceanographic research in 1995 in the Mediterranean. And um, so I've been in, quite involved and just gave a talk on this last 70 years of paleoceanography and how that enhanced our view of climate change through time, including our own, uh, greatly influenced by my advisors, uh, giants in their field, uh, John Embry, uh, Wally Broker, uh, Bill Berggren and others, um, Bill Rudderman. And when I retired, I started teaching all courses, Earth's climate, past, present, and future concerns and solutions. And one of those solutions was biochar. So, um, and uh, my CV can be found on that Denver Climate Study Group, as well as the biochar tab, as well as this presentation that I put on the bottom link here, denverclimatestudygroup.com. If you go to the biochar tab, you'll see resources and somebody can put that in the chat and might be, you, know, you can save it and look for this presentation as well there. I just loaded it up. So the why, what, resources, the case for biochar sequestration, uh, per the blog spot um, that you gave, um, I don't know, an email or somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a member of the UU Whidbey Island. I'm, I'm UU from years back. I'm, I moved here. I've joined CCL. I joined UUCWI. That's where I met Gary and um, where he dragged me into doing this presentation, basically, introduced you to, me to you and so forth. It's Thanks, just Gary. <laughs> um, you know, in my view, in the Denver Climate Study Group, it wasn't just about climate change. It became a sustainability issue, an energy issue, an economic issue, a population issue. Uh, climate change is just one part of that. And, uh, and, and the earth will survive. Um, it, but it's, you know, it's more than just that. It's, it's about our, our, our practices, our, our changing our viewpoint from human, our human supremacy viewpoint basically to uh, one that's sustainable practices and solutions and going forth. Uh, choices we make now affect us, affect our more than our grandkids, several generations future. And it's our sustainability. So why is it, why is biochar important? It's good for soil regeneration. It's also for sequestration. So then that way it's a win-win situation for the soil, for the environment, and for sequestration, taking out the excesses that we've put in, um, unbeknownst to us, with our use of fossil fuels and and uh, trying to wean ourselves off that for the change for the better, is what all this is about. And it's why it's all hands on deck for sustainable practices and methods of doing it. So I wanna get into terminology briefly. Um, carbon neutral, carbon negative, and carbon positive. Uh, carbon neutral is, is uh, the age before the Industrial Revolution, basically. Um, um, it's using for the biosphere and living in the biosphere. And 
it's it's process of photosynthesis uh, going on seasonally every day um, and de in decomposition, including burning and so forth to heat ourselves or, or whatever animals did. Carbon negative is putting it away and that's new relatively, um, except in very minor amounts where it might've been longer term. But carbon positive is burning of fossil fuels, making fertilizer, using natural gas, uh, using it for transportation uh, to farms in terms of fertilizer. So I have those listed in, under fertilizers, but any, anything, any fossil fuel use, coal, natural gas, oil are carbon positive. It's taking old photosynthesis and that's been buried in the ground for millions of years or less. And that's become available for us to mine in coal or extract in drilling oil and fracking oil and gas, basically. We have, according to the IPCC 2018 report, 11 years to stop runaway climate change, basically. And I've taken some of these slides from Deborah Cook and then I've taken some from um, a CCL presentation you'll see later. Um, there's a need to, for the climate issues, there's a need for decarbonizing energy um, in, all, in, in, in all its forms uh, for, for um, electricity, for, for transportation, for manufacturing. But there's also a need for sequestration because we've gone up 40% at a very rapid rate and it's causing ocean acidification, it's causing global warming and extreme weather events and, and all the other um, impacts it has. So what is biochar? You see here a picture, a def the definition link in Wiki and it's fair. And this is a soil in the tropics in the Amazon and this is a soil also in the tropics in the Amazon. It's unusual to be dark because, in, because with un, unlimited sunlight, everything goes into growth into the canopy. So the Amazonians either by accident or, and as far as I know by, from archeologists, it's not necessarily deliberate, but they had fires and they had them fires for tens of thousands of years, a couple thousand. That, couple tens anyway, or thereabouts. And those fires, as occurs in Iowa for that matter too, with the grassland fires, ends up putting carbon in, in the soil. The carbon that didn't go to ash, completely to ash. And so you have where these habitats were, enriched soils that remain enriched and provide a microhabitat for fungi and bacteria and micro soil microbes. So, it's charcoal that's buried in the soil and it's as a soil amendment. It's made from biomass via pyrolysis. So then what is pyrolysis? Um, but before I get to that, then it's negative, car you know, I'm taking excerpts from Wikipedia here at negative carbon emissions. And that means se carbon sequestration. It helps for soil in terms of fertility, acidic soils and depleted soils in particular. I, a word of caution here. So it's charcoal, but don't use commercial charcoal because it's produced at a different temperature to leave some of the tars behind for ignition for heat product, um, basically. So it's it's not exactly the same. Um, the biochar we make from waste ag um, essentially goes to 450C to 500C, and it's just leaving 99% carbon left in the honeycomb structures of that cellulosic property, those cellulosic properties. You know it from being, being at campfires, you see those spurts of, of air, um, of gases, and they, they're burning in the fire. That's pyrolysis gas, that's wood gas. And mostly wood gas is carbon monoxide and methane coming out in that process of heat. Uh, so there's a pyrolysis, there's a, there's, and there's a pyrolysis gas, there's a luminous burst, burning of that gas, um, and there's the combustion products that go out, leaves behind a char. And the same thing for the campfire. 
what you see on the surface here is ash, but the charcoal, if you could, any fire you have, you may get remaining charcoal, save it. Don't, don't use it to burn to the next fire. Save it and crumple it and distribute it in your garden or yard or whatever. It, it helps sequester carbon, basically, as opposed to completely burning it. Pyrolysis, fire in an oxygen-starved environment. And this is an example that Gary and I have been doing at um, my home and our neighbor and at Pacific Rim Institute on Whidbey Island. You essentially have a tub. It's got no holes in it. It's, it's not being a good boy scout here. You don't burn it from the bottom. You burn it from the top. And it's slow to start, particularly if it's not if it's not really dry, ideally 20 to 25 percent maximum moisture content in that wood. And you start it from the top and it radiates down. And of course, it's going to be oxygen starved at the bottom. But the heat is going to continue to create wood gas out of that wood that's on the bottom. And this is too full in this case, but uh, and we, we learned the lesson, but I got a picture here to show you. It should be two thirds full, not, not as high as this up. And basically you see it burning here when it's going and it's clean, relatively clean. And it's not necessarily it's emission free and that is an issue, but we're trying to make it with the skirt to curl it so that as emission free as possible. When it's all dying down, the wood gases are embering. There's no ash yet. And that's just about the time you want to quench it. And you quench it and you spill it out and you continue quenching it so that it doesn't reignite and burn to ash. So the, the carbon cycle basically is atmospheric photosynthesis. It decays or burns or used for food and it returns back to the atmosphere. In one year, two years, five years, uh, forest decays longer. So there's gonna be variable amounts, but that's that's a biospheric uh, regeneration basically. With biochar, you're taking about 20 to 25% and you're sequestering it in a recalcitrant carbon. It doesn't react. It remains in the soil uh, for hundreds to maybe thousands of years. The rest will, you might say, is accelerated when you just burn it in the atmosphere like that, is it's accelerated decomposition instead of one, two, five, ten years of, of what might happen in a forest. It's it's accelerating it into the atmosphere. And yes, that's a drawback. Ideally, you should have a retort unit, but they're expensive. And out of the retort units, you can capture that wood gas instead of burning it and make a biofuel. And there's research at National Renewable Energy Lab to, to do just that. Or use the heat somehow for pre-drying your, your stock or if your feed stock or, or for heating greenhouses or whatever. And of course, there's a carbon monoxide issue potential too. So you gotta be careful. So, it can be used to address some of the most urgent environmental problems of our time, soil degradation, food insecurity, water pollution from agriculture, chemicals and, and um, climate change. Um, soil fertility as, you know, by natural means as opposed to um, natural gas generated fertilizers. Um, you could reverse, there's been estimates of if you um, used all this organic matter, waste organic matter and converted it to biochar, you could actually go back to too, too far, too mm -hmm. low, but that's not certainly not our issue right now these days. Um, it's best used in, it, it's best used in depleted environments. Whoops. One pound of biochar removes 3.7 pounds of CO2. It's hard to get grasp on numbers if you're not using them every day. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, even I am at a loss exactly uh, 
to, to be familiar with the, with the terms every day. The benefits, it fights drought in that it retains moisture in that honeycomb structure. It um, increases soil fertility um, because it provides the microhabitats for fungi, bacteria, and other microbes and microbes that, and, and or other micro, um, soil microorganisms that are feeding on, on all that. Um, we're still learning about our soil and I'm still learning about biochar, even though I've known about it 13 years, as you'll see some of these slides that were, were continuing research is going on to understand it better. Um, improved plant helps, cleans up toxins. I know um, Norm Baker at, at, um, in Squim, Washington uses it in his chicken coops to help um, absorb the urea and, and, uh, and then the century it, it makes its sensory being um, inoculated properly for use in this garden later. So from a simple cook stove to sophisticated retort units, it's transportable. And when you get a retort unit, they cost a lot, maybe a million bucks or whatever. And so thus you can't have those in every corner or every county or every, uh, every town for sure. So then it becomes a balance of, of issues of how, how much are you willing to transfer? What's the cost of transportation? Is it a fossil fuel transportation means? Uh, you know, all these things have to come into consideration for determining what you're going to do um, in terms of burning it versus bringing it to a, a retort unit. And where where is that to begin with? Um, here in Northwest Washington, uh, we're looking at a multi-county um, centralized agency to do that. Um, so the tea lud is a top lit updraft unit cook stove. If you have that flame, as you see in the upper left here, and you put a plate on it, uh, you can cook on it. And so otherwise it's, it's another way of versus a flame cap kiln of creating biochar. Um, the emissions are much better in those cases than an open kiln. Um, you know, if you can somehow get the heat exchange for heat, heating your greenhouses, um, the mobile gas pyrolysis unit, and so it, and that's that's a that's another point. If you can move those units, fine. Um, but some of them are, are really too big uh, to be, or or the efficiency degrades too. It's got economic benefits in terms of savings on fertilizer, but. You know, you you look at the cost of biochar; it's not cheap either. So the, there's economics. If you do it on, if you can do it on your own, all the more power to you and the helps basically. Um, but there's just so many hours in the day to a farmer and uh, and or get volunteers to do help help you out. Um, there are companies that are doing it. Uh, they've had their their pluses and minuses and, and, and troubles. Cool Planet was a very successful company. It had great support in Colorado, but it did go under. Um, um, unclear all the reasons, but, but um, anyway, it spawns new businesses, toxic waste removal, it's something we wanna look at for stormwater remediation in the Pacific Northwest, because we're finding out the tire dust and some of its components and new newer tires is killing the coho salmon or and one species of the salmon. Or, um, and we're still coming to grips to understand that. And how, how do you remediate? How do you control uh, stormwater drainage, uh, which is have, have multiple inputs? Drawdown, in my opinion, ranks and by all the experts I know of biochar, it's ranked way down. And, and part of it is because it's not easily, um, what's the term? Um, 
um, for for models. It's, it's not easily modeled uh, for for what because it's so variable. How do you, how do you know what's going to be produced? Um, is some of it depends on 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 the local farmers to do it. So it's hard to model is what it amounts to. Uh, whereas direct air capture, despite capital investment, um, you can say, well, I'm going to spend this much and this much for direct air capture DAC units, and it's going to produce, capture this much CO2. It's going to take this much energy to compress it to a supercritical CO2 to re-inject it, which is a cost of pumps, to saline aquifers. Um, those and so that's mod, that's they can model that. Um, it's it's less. It's not as easy to to model biochar. Same thing for BEX, BECCS, bioenergy, carbon capture and sequestration. Same capture usually in flue pipes. There's a new solution that's been discovered in Iceland and being uh, implemented here in Washington, and that's injecting supercritical CO2, this is a, a digression, but it's worth noting, um, into basalt. It, supercritical CO2 into basalt will quickly weather that basalt and create calcium carbonate, and that's a permanent fixture in, in the ground unless you get acid water is going through it, but that's, that's not, uh, that's normal weather is what happens. Remember we, Commit, we ex, ex, emit 36 to 40 gigatons of CO2 each year. The scenarios given in the drawdown tables gives 2.2 gigatons, um, and that's 2020 to 2050, and 4.39 gigatons on the 1.5 degree scenario um, in that table of solutions, basically. It's a very small amount is, is measured in here in this case. So why hasn't it gotten tr green traction? Lack of knowledge, no demand. Um, you need places like California or Colorado that are burning up that to uh, appreciate. We got to get rid of this biomass and not just, and if we're going to burn it, why not save some of it into for ag benefit? Um, so lack of supply in some cases, the, the, the need to dry your, your um, feedstock is important. Regionalization, raw material availability, and the application is complex. One kiln takes to bake that burn is three to four hours. Well, that's a lot of standing around in the meantime. If you had uh, half a, have a dozen of such kilns going at one time, that's a more effect, efficacious use of a person monitoring it and you need water to quench it. So commercial charcoal, as I mentioned, um, lower temperatures creates unparalyzed tars and many impregnated with start, starting fluids. This is a little redundant from my morning before. The drawbacks, it is labor intensive. It is a drying the feedstock an issue and it's usually, utilizing waste heat would be ideal. So a quick blueprint given by Deborah Cook, raise some dollars to build some retort units and two trained staff for retort units to start. Create national nonprofits, get, get, get pilot money to do this from your legislature or non, or, um, other grant agencies um, to manage the funds, to choose types and sites of retorts, train staff, and we're doing that here in, in Northwest and need to be done everywhere else. So Jean Nightingale, is she here by the way? I don't know. Um, I didn't check the, the list, but um, she was approached by Carol and, and uh, along with Gary and myself, and she gave me some information about the background of where she did some studies in 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 Cuba, and so she she can speak a little more to to that if she's here. And but Cuban Cuban soil, as most tropical soils uh, or subtropical soils, are, are poor, and when Russia left, they took their fossil fuel based fertilizers with them. 
climate change it affected our potato and coffee crops and it's overrun by marabou or thorny scrub i have no idea what that is but it's probably like kudzu in the southeast and runs amok and you can use it harvest it and make biochar out of it we did that with some waste um, um, blackberry bushes here in, at Pacific Rim Institute recently. It's a win-win for soil soils, so for the soils and sequestration and environmental justice in this case. In the Cuban solution, click here for a link and click there for a background sheet, which are also on the web pages, independent units. You won't have to come to this presentation to go find those units. Go to denverclimatestudygroup.com, click on the biochar tab, and they're there. So she's involved with econet.org, basically, that are trying to work um, in third world countries for, for some of this stuff. And, and I didn't vet this anymore. I'm presenting you the information. I am familiar with Ethos, Engineers for Technical and Humanitarian Opportunities of Service. Never heard of them till I moved here. And I attended the conference a year ago, but I didn't attend this one. And they look at the cook stoves and not necessarily biochar cook stoves, but some of them are biochar cook stoves. And I'll show you that in a minute. But they're looking to for uh, third world countries for healthier environments for cooking, as opposed to cooking with char to make, to use, to make uh, stoves. And so this is a pellet stove that leaves ch pelletized char behind, but it's a clean burn. And here's a tea lug using it as a, with a cook pot on top, leaving charcoal behind as well. So those things exist. It's a top lip up draft stove. So the inputs, waste ag, the paralysis, without oxygen, that's uh, oxygen is crossed out. And then you have the retort units. The output, you know, can, can be used for electricity, process to heat, wood vinegar, that I don't know enough about, but of course that's an acidic issue, potentially too. Industrials, fuel, biofuels basically. Soil amendment, water filtration, sludge treatment, land remediation, asphalt additives. And that's where uh, burn using fire to cool the earth. If you don't have a place to put it in the earth, you can put it in asphalt, you can put it in, in concrete, you can, it, it, you can sequester it away in those ways as well. But how it, you know, it's got great benefit for soils and plants it improves the soil structure it keeps it aerated keeps moisture um, increases the microbe activity and there's even claims um, i don't know how if that this has been documented but it continues sequestering carbon into the soil by the fact that it continues creating um, the living space for soil microbes to continue on and and as that continues to enrich the soil, it's a sequestration agent. Increases crop health, crop yield. And there's some documentation of that here. For the yield increase, for a biochar soil that's probably been inoculated, it's nitrogen poor to, to begin with. So just putting it in the soil might take a, a year or two because of that depletion. Um, so if you can mix it with compost and let it sit for a year, that, that's ideal. Uh, I don't know the details. There is a great listserv um, that, where these people talk about it all the time. So I gained these from a March 9th CCL Ag Action Team. If you're any of your citizens climate lobbyists, uh, I support the group. I'm a member. I support the group and their efforts and found out about the CCO Ag, Ag Group Culture Action. Citizens Climate Lobby is a an, an lobbying agency wanting to put a fee on carbon fuels and a dividend payback. But they recognize the uh, and support 
other actions as well. They're not lobbying for those actions, but they're, you know, they're, they're putting like-minded people together for different. So the yield gain uh, for tomatoes, onions, lettuce, um, I don't know the difference between Loma and, and mascara lettuce, but anyway, and, and oaky lettuce for that matter. But these, this guy, Jeff Theo is at the Washington State Extension Service that gave that talk. Um, the yield gain versus the profit, you know, this might be, the biochar cost might be more expensive than the fertilizer, but they don't fully appreciate the gain without fertilizers, without without the uh, that. So it's a matter of educating farmers to the to a certain extent and uh, uh, putting out more at the outlay to get a better yield ultimately. Which crops accounts for most of the acres? This is in um, U.S. cropland that Jeff Thiel. Uh, uh, collected. Um, I haven't personally vetted it, but the wheat, vegetables, corn, cotton, hay, soybeans, and other field crops. Corn is the first one. Soybeans next. Wheat. I guess I could have put this as a quiz for y'all. Hay, cotton, and other. Others generally always going to be the last one, right? Well, no, it's not vegetables. Others, I th stand corrected. Sorry about that. But they're they're down there. So. He's got this table and I'm not gonna address this, but it's it's there for you to peruse and think about and maybe get a hold of Jeff Thiel. I don't I don't have his contact information handy here, but anyway. Um, at scale the carbon storage is documented here, basically megatons of carbon dioxide stored per year at one ton per acre yield. So the scaling policy and infrastructure he proposes, you know, the interlinking of research to product certification, the research studies, the feed-in tariffs, the carbon credit markets. I'm not an economist, um, so, we, we need them, those people to help us understand and, and educate the benefits, the cost benefits, the business economics for making it successful. My four favorite websites, I list them here, US Biochar Initiative, and particularly their um, education section. I got a whole bunch of videos and slides and, and uh, ways to learn more about it. IBI, um, Carbon Brief, and Wilson Biochar, if you want to do it on your own here, she'll do flame cap kiln as well as um, uh, circle, uh, the organ kiln, or as well as the uh, ring of fire, as she calls it. Biochar Basics that Gary helped put together, and there's a link to Gary's uh, summation. We might update it here in the near future. But if you, if you want to see Alan Bates, who's the author of the book, Burn, one of the co-authors along with Kathleen Draper, he gives a good 30 minute how um, YouTube video of how this is a solution to our climate cycle crisis. So my contact information is here. Um, the slides are available at Denver Climate Study Group. And with that, I'll stop sharing and see if you got any questions. I put in the, oh, sorry, I put in the chat a Washington state law that passed this year, which does uh, require that the Department of Natural Resources deal with the biochar issue. I didn't know that. Yeah, Thank it's, you. it's rather vague in what it's going to do, but it at least mentions biochar. 
Okay, and I, I, I can't maintain looking at the chat or yeah. while, while doing a presentation, so thank you. Gary, do you know about it? Well, I just learned about it from Bill, as a matter of fact. No, I didn't, and uh, I'm encouraged to learn about it because other people have mentioned, uh, uh, alluded to it without giving me a specific so uh, Washington, out here in Washington states, we've made great strides uh, in climate justice and environmental justice issue in this last legislative session. Um, but I, I wanna thank uh, you, Paul, for this uh, comprehensive, it's a huge area. It's a huge area. And uh, one of the reasons it's in the biochar book or uh, drawdown is that it's uh, doable and scalable. Yesterday, we had our fifth biochar demonstration at uh, the Pacific Rim Institute. And uh, we, it is gaining increased in, uh, interest. This is a small scale, very rudimentary um, uh, example of how you can make uh, biochar with just scavenged uh, items. We use a... Uh, basically a uh, what we think was a uh, half uh, of what we think was a uh, hot water tank for an industrial purpose cut in half. So it's about uh, three feet high and about three feet wide, three or four feet wide. And uh, we use a, uh, a, a metal screen made of tin around it to uh, a, a, accentuate the process. But it shows, uh, it demonstrates to people uh, just how clean a process it is. When you're burning this uh, material, um, the fire is on top and the uh, material that's being pyrolyzed or baked is releasing uh, gases, as Paul mentioned, and feeding uh, the fire that heats up the uh, Heats up the bio, the, the feedstock. Uh, yeah, the feedstock. That's the right term. Anyway, um, my battery's about to quit, so I'm. Uh, there was one question in the chat, Paul, about uh, what the heck is a retort? Okay. okay. It, it basically it's um, it's a pyrolysis unit that captures that. A pyrolysis unit, you need heat, you need fuel, but you don't need oxygen. Um, and in that process, you you convert the, the the feedstock to wood gases. The wood gases are captured, and those those can be used um, in in terms of making fuels. And uh, the um, I got distracted, sorry. Um, so, so they gotta, so you don't need oxygen, you need to heat and you need to fuel and you capture that basically. I think Gary got, got bumped off with it, died, died, his battery died, but anyway. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I'm not well versed in preparing to, to answer that very well, I guess. Um, uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm Jan Thompson in uh, Las Cruces, Mexico. You're, you're frozen right now, to me anyway. Am I? Oh, all right. Um, I, I can hear you, Jan. Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. okay. Well, you used a lot of terms that I'm not familiar with, sure. <laughs> but I'm not a scientist. Uh, um, I am, uh, I'm actually, a, what I am is a peace advocate and my uh, congressional representative, Yvette Harrell, uh, is a Trump supporter. Um, she, even after the insurrection on the 6th, she voted against um, uh, uh, acknowledging the vote. Um, and, so, and she's in the hip pocket of oil and gas here in New Mexico. We do rely heavily on oil and gas for our state's income, unfortunately, we're trying to diversify. Uh, she, however, has introduced uh, a bill regarding biochar. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm horribly suspicious. Uh, you seem quite dedicated to it. You seem to believe that this is, uh, this is a direction that we could go that would be helpful. Yeah. And, and it's a way, and it's a way of yeah, getting. Yeah, but I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it exactly. I, I, there's got to be a catch because she's proposing it. You see, <laughs> I mean, she's no. just terrible. Well, some sometimes we turn off um, others by saying it's a climate solution. Well, we don't have to talk about climate solution. It's a farming solution. Um, and 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 I think that's probably where she's going with it, uh, and not talking. She probably could care less about the climate. I don't know her or that you're talking about, but meaning sometimes it's not. It's judicious not to use the word climate, and and talk about it being a benefit for the soil, and that's being recognized independent of climate issues. Um, is it a benefit for desert soil? Yes, absolutely. And the, the, the problem is with desert soils, and there was a talk recently, I'm involved with the Ethics and Ecological Economics Forum in Denver, um, is you can't, the surface application, if it's fine, could just get blown away too. And that's, mm-hmm. not, that's not good either. So you, you need yeah. to till it in and tilling is not, uh, not a good good solution either but we prefer to do no-till methods but you gotta you gotta bring it into the soil somehow and if you just in desert environments that's that's more of a challenge uh, the soils are really pretty poor in there but and and so I, I'm on the fence about desert environments in terms of um, the benefit um, because you need some moisture in the soil to retain micro, soil microbes too. So um, it probably, but you know, as you know, a lot of the desert environments are using irrigation too. So, uh, of course, uh, as long as it'll last. Uh, but but the um, uh, what about emissions in the processing? Well, that's an issue. I don't deny that, um, but. These slash piles are just burned to ash. That's that's a that's Wait, that's all that's all emissions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Including um, I, I particulate. Have, and they're, yeah, and, they're, I, and, they're, and they're, when you, when you see gray smoke, the emissions are horrible. So you want to try to avoid the smoke. And most of these slash piles are are filled with moisture laden feedstock, and thus high in emissions, higher than what I'm, what, than the process of what we're doing here. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Um, yeah, uh, th- this is Doris. I have two questions, um, but I want to make sure others go first. I see a question from Bill. Do forest fires produce biochar that can be free- recycled into the soil? Um, yes. yes, the answer is yes, but it's not, not uh, most of it gets burned to ash. And if it's a hot enough fire, they're burning it. They're burning the rootstock. Even I've seen that happen, and the soil is collapsing around, and that's that's killing the whole microbes. So that's that's an uncontrolled burn. Um, biochar. You've seen slash piles. Um, Kelpie's website and book will mention slash piles. They're they're killing the, the soil microbes deep into the soil. A kiln as Gary will attest, is, is leaving the grass green under that kiln because it's not, it's not going all the way to the bottom. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a more controlled burn and because you're, partly because you're quenching it. So um, I'll, I'll just throw out a three-part question. It, 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 the answer should be fairly easy. So can, can, does it only have to be woody product or can it be leafy and twiggy product what does inoculated mean? And okay. when you use biochar to fertilize the soil, is it a one-year benefit? Is it a 10-year benefit? Is there a way to quantify that? You can, yeah. <laughs> All right, so to begin with, uh, leafy products and other stuff, yes. The issue becomes moisture content. And if it's too moist, it's gonna create a lot of smoke. So you, you need to be a dry product. Uh, we used, we used um, 
leaves and twigs from um, from blackberry bushes, and that burned very well. Um, so the next part questions. Um, In inoculated. Inoculation means um, just plain biochar by itself is, char is, is carbon. Well, carbon by itself it might create the microhabitat, but it doesn't, it's lacking the nitrogen. So urea is an excellent component and or the compost is a nice component to inoculate, to help create the balance of nutrients needed for microbes um, to continue enhancing that soil. Um, so compost by itself is great. Uh, as I think most of you know, our manure is great. Um, of course, fresh manure has got the nutrients to mix with the biochar to great, super great compost. Even, I guess horse manure is an excellent, coffee grounds are excellent to put in the soil almost immediately, whereas cow manure is too rich and it needs to be composted for a while. So that, that's an ideal application. The next part, what was that? Oh, um, Paul, can I interrupt for a second and just, uh, I have a explanation uh, which seems to resonate with people in that uh, the biochar that you see at uh, Bill's left or uh, Paul's left elbow is basically uh, carbon and it's the structure of the carbon that produces the um, it's like putting an apartment building in the ground for these soil organisms to inhabit. Oh, it. And it's, it, it, and because it uh, retains nutrients and water and provides air passage, uh, it provides them with everything they need to uh, prosper. In the meantime, the plants above them are, are benefiting. And if you look at his, above his left shoulder, where the burn is in process, and that's the system we use, you will see very, you won't see smoke coming off of that. You see that? Oh, um, I, I've, see see I've seen gases the coming off of in answer to the one question. Okay. Yeah, and have to be pinned or so. But okay, and then the, um, the, 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 the last question was, um, when you use biochar in the soil, do you get a one-year yeah. benefit or 10-year, or is, is there any way to quantify that? Um, it, it's, it's a very long-term benefit, um, and to the point where you shouldn't not need to use fertilizers. Um, but you should amend it to like 10% of your compost. Uh, uh, so you can continue adding it as you produce it and it'll continue enhancing the soil. But of course, that, that, the benefit levels off eventually. Um, but it's a long-term benefit. And, and I don't have the answer for the quantification of that. And uh, um, IBI might, uh, the International Biochar in Initiative or the US Biochar Initiative, the education people, it, it's hard to keep on track of everything. Uh, they, they, there was a great, great um, biochar week that dealt with all those forests um, mitigation, um, farm mitigation at the U.S. Biochar Initiative this past, this Great. past December. Great. Great. Um, thank you so much. I Nothing. have, when, whenever um, I, I uh, have the honor of having guest speakers, I like to send them a sustainable development goal lapel pin. And oh, so... And so I will, um, if, if you would send me your, your mailing address privately, I would love to uh, send you that gift um, on behalf of myself and UU Ministry for Earth. Thank you. It's um, likely in my signature file though, but yes. I'll okay, send it. okay. Um, so, so I'm gonna go to share screen. Hello everyone um, who's, who's new to the session. I'm Doris Marlin. I'm sharing the drawdown screen um, of the fact sheet that has the biochar uh, information within drawdown. But, and I, I just want you to know it exists with all, uh, with um, fact sheets for all of the solutions that are included in 
uh, Project Drawdown. Um, we are in Project Drawdown because this is an initiative to essentially raise awareness among Unitarian Universalists and have us all become more familiar, um, practice more actions, learn more together. What we're looking at right now is my um, dashboard in my Drawdown Eco Challenge. And um, I just want to show you that so far, um, the organization of UUDD 2021, um, here we go. Uh, we so far have um, 253 participants. We have earned almost 40,000 points. And our impacts so far of our organization, we are up to 3,300 actions. Uh, we're in 24 states and three countries, that's US, Canada, and India. Um, we have, um, let's see, carpooled 75 miles so far only recycled 42 plastic containers. So we need to start logging more of those because I'm sure we're doing plenty more. Um, when you uh, choose this action and the action um, with Natalie that we will be um, doing next, um, you will add to what our, our collective group is doing. So, so far we've, um, uh, saved 1,800 pounds of CO2 from going into the atmosphere. Uh, we've contacted 79 public officials about advocacy actions related to drawdown, any number of things. And this, this is where you would find it. If you have joined, you can go to, the, to your dashboard, look at the impacts for your organization, or even just for myself. So I can look at my own impacts and see um, what I've contributed. Um, and the way that you can log credit for these actions is on your dashboard page. Once you've signed up to participate, um, like, okay, great. I have just learned about biochar and I have previously selected this action. And let me just make sure I've, everyone is seeing my screen, right? Yep. <laughs> Okay, that's good. So I have previously selected this and now I've completed it. So I'm gonna say, yay. Um, I have just spent, we'll go with 50 minutes learning about biochar and I'm submitting that. And there I get a congratulations, Doris. You've done it, yay, you've learned about biochar. So, um, so, so how did I get this into uh, my selected actions in the first place? Well, let's look at, um, I, I will select what, I, what we're about to do with Natalie, uh, the next session. So I'm going to manage actions. I'm going to electricity. And I'm going to, I, I, I have already reviewed the actions that are available in electricity. And um, the best fit is explore other electricity solutions. So that is what will be applied for our, our next session. And I'm going to say, I will spend 50 minutes learning with Natalie about other electricity solutions. And now I've selected this action. And if I go back to my dashboard, it is now showing on explore other electricity solutions. And once um, we've heard Natalie's presentation, I will hit this button again and it will give me a one-time action done just like I learned with biochar. Um, so uh, again, what we're, what we're 
our goal is 10,000 actions by the end of June for um, the whole UU Drawdown 2021 initiative. So um, with, with that, I, I will again thank Paul and, and Gary for connecting us in the first place. And um, uh, transition over to Natalie because this is really a fascinating and very timely and relevant presentation and discussion of the draw that um, uh, data centers and you know all, all this great technology we have all this great internet technology is, is wonderful but none of us have paid very close attention to the environmental impact of it. And that's something we have to be aware of and figure out how to manage better. So with that